Hi guys, Mr. Pulley here, We're looking at uh, Emerging Europe and the Byzantine Empire, this is chapter 9 in Western Civilization. Uh, we're going to break this one up into several smaller videos, and we're going to try and organize that in a way that's easier for you to understand. We're going to start with looking at feudalism, a new system of government and protection that develops in Europe uh, after the fall of the Roman Empire uh, and the development that happened therein. Uh, we're going to look at some of the early kingdoms that develop in uh, Europe, uh, the Franks and Charlemagne and some of those ideas as well. We're going to then move to the idea of religion and its vast and very important role it plays in medieval Europe all the way through the Renaissance into uh, much later ages. We're going to then go back and look at the Byzantine Empire and the Byzantines. Uh, there's actually a split in religions between the church in the West, which becomes the Roman Catholic Church, and the church in the East, which becomes the Orthodox Church. And finally, we'll finish up with the Crusades, uh, Christians going to the middle, uh, middle East, to the uh, Holy Land, to try to get that back from the Muslims. Again, I said we're going to start with feudalism here, so let's get it started there. Um, feudalism is a system of decentralized organization of defense and governance provided by establishing a personal relationship, personal relationships among nobles through ceremonial acts. These acts are homage, where I publicly come out and through an oath of loyalty, that's fealty, I swear my allegiance to this lord, okay? In return for doing that, this creates a personal relationship with a hierarchy of a lord at the top, a vassal beneath that, which is referred to as vassalage. Now, this creates a system through which mutual obligations are established. The Lord gives the vassal support in the form of a fief, which is land, and protection, while the vassal gives to his Lord military service and loyalty. Now, the agreement that determined the relationship between the Lord and the vassal is a feudal contract. It's not a written contract, it's basically an oral contract, but it's still a contract. Okay, moving on with feudalism here. Okay. The local lords gain power, and the reason why they gain power is they're trying to deal with some social problems. Okay? First of all, we got wars and invasions. We've got local lords fighting each other because of that. We've got a weakened uh, Western Europe, Vikings coming in from the north, uh, the Mongols chasing the Magyars into what becomes uh, Hungary later on, but it's the Mongols who are chasing them. We didn't wait for it. We went right there. Uh, the Muslims also attacking into Europe uh, from the east and also even from uh, the west coming up uh, across North Africa and through Spain and taking over all of Spain. We'll see the collapse of central governments. The Roman Empire, as we know, fell, collapsed in the west. The Byzantine Empire is still in the east. Uh, Charlemagne builds a large empire uh, in what is today modern-day France and Germany, but uh, after his death, that quickly falls apart as well. So there's a need for these local lords to provide protection against these invaders, the Vikings, the Mongols, the Muslims, etc., and to bear the costs, the military costs, of that sort of protection and defense. But it's also a political system because it helps provide well, it's land in exchange for protection, in return for services, and those services that those vassals have to give to the Lord are an army and equipment, knights and horses and suits of armor and all those types of things. It's also a way to keep order, okay? We've got the local Lord swearing loyalty, allegiance to the king, and in return that king provides protection. It's a way to organize society into a social structure, a feudal relation that creates what we refer to as a feudal pyramid. Now that feudal pyramid looks something like this. We've got the king at the very top. Uh, he's the guy who has all of the land, but he doesn't have the resources to be able to control and take care of all that land. Money and trade have basically disappeared because of all these invasions and warfare, and so he's got lots of land, but no real money to control it. So he gives some of the land to the lords and the nobles and the barons, and because of that, they can now then uh, provide some tax money to him and protection from knights. Well, they can't control the land they get. They divide it up amongst knights and other lesser nobles. Uh, eventually, we get down to the peasants, who are the folks who provide food uh, up to the, the uh, top levels. Uh, we also see the serfs who are actually peasants who are a special class sort of between peasants and slaves who are sort of tied to the land. They can't leave the land. They come with the land that's granted as a fief. Uh, can't leave it without the permission of the lord of that manor. 
Now missing from that other pyramid was the clergy, the church officials. And in this one here, we can see here the church officials in here. In fact, we've kind of built this in, in a uh, Gallic style architecture with our flying buttresses here. But our church officials here are being shown below the king. And this is going to be something of uh, a struggle between the political side, the kings and the barons, and the church side, uh, the popes and the cardinals and the bishops, or who is in charge? Hey, which world is more important? Who has more say? Uh, the king have his authority because God grants it through the Pope and the church, or does the church have uh, power because the king protects it and helps pre uh, preserve it? Okay. Going on with feudalism here, a couple terms. Fief is a grant of land that is given in exchange for that military service. Uh, along with that land usually comes a manor or a state or maybe a castle. Maybe you have to build it early on. And also comes with that is serfs, these peasants who are tied to the land. And we've been talking about men for the most part because it is the Middle Ages and they're the ones that sort of count, so to speak. But there are noble women as well. Uh, they are responsible for the supervision of the manor. When that lord is away, or her husband is away, uh, giving that 40 plus days of military service a year to the, the king or his lord, uh, then someone has to be in charge of the manor. And hopefully he's got a nice educated wife, a noble woman, to help manage things while he is away. There's also a code of behavior for the knights and the nobles called the code of chivalry. This is influenced by ideas of the church. This is the ideas of like the good Samaritan. You do things because it's the right thing to do, not for any reward or justification or uh, uh, like with the Romans when they took over new areas in exchange for your service, you're going to get wealthy or get some land. No, this is just because it's the right thing to do. Now let's look at our estate here. This might be the king up here at top in his very large castle later on. They have to build these things first out of wood, later out of uh, stone. They're cold, they're drafty, they're for defense. They're not for luxury early on. So they're not the greatest places to live. Uh, then later on, we, he's good, given uh, some of his land away, divided up to earls and barons. They've got their castles as well. They've divided up their land to their tenants in chief. These might be your local knights, but they've got then in their possession a manor, uh, an estate, so to speak. It has a somewhat fortified household region and then a village and tenants that live there, peasants uh, who might be uh, somewhat of the local merchants or shopkeepers and then the farmers, the serfs who are tied to the land, that's all part of the feudal system. That's where we're going to stop with this one, with feudalism. We'll come back to those other areas later and a few other videos. Thanks for watching.